What is good? We're back. We got our boy Austin. How you doing, bud? Good, man. Talking some rookies today. This is going to be a fun one. I'm excited. Nothing yeah. better than talking about the 2024 class. Let's be honest. Oh, um, yeah. It's, it's always it's, it's the best. You know, the offseason of Dynasty is always the most fun. The in season's cool because you got a chance to win money and grind, but you put all your things to uh, all your picks and all your takes to, to work. And now we get to go in here. We get to talk all these rookies and we got a whole cycle and it's going to be a lot of fun. So um, I think right now in super flex tight end premium, you have one one through one seven pretty much is seems like it's wrapped up. I don't think it's going to change a ton. You might have it jostled up different in that one through seven, but that's not really what we're here right now to talk about. Uh, I want to talk about how the draft is kind of starting at that uh, one eight position. And, you know, it's unclear who those guys really are. There's a lot of jostling. And, and through this process for, from the combine and draft capital and all that, we'll, we'll start to piece that together a little bit more. But right now, there's been kind of two guys that seem to me to be really jockeying for that position, at least in a lot of people's minds. And I'm seeing it all over the place. So those two guys are Troy Franklin from Oregon and Brian Thomas Jr., from LSU. So we wanted to dive into them a little bit, see who we're feeling a little bit more right now. And then maybe at the end of this, some other guys who we might think could jump up into that position or if they're even worthy for this position. So um, right off the rip, let's let's jump into Brian Thomas Jr. first. He's 6'4", 205. They've got him projected at us a first rounder somewhere between 23 and 28 is what I'm seeing on uh, the, the uh, mock draft database. Uh, he's 21. He'll be 22 in October. So through the draft process, he'll be 21. So that's pretty solid. He had 87 targets, uh, 1177 yards. That's good for 13th overall. Uh, he had 2.61 yards per route run. That was 37th overall. 11 missed tackles forced. 7.3 yards per reception. Number one in touchdowns was 17. 386 yards a yak, 5.7 yak per reception. The eight out of 13.9 and 48 first downs. That was tied for 18th. Um, so Brian Thomas Jr. putting out a pretty good profile, but obviously on the other side of him, you got Malik Neighbors. So, you know, is he is he a product of of Malik Neighbors uh, or is he, you know, just kind of doing his own thing the way the NFL is looking at it? They're they're thinking that he's kind of doing his own thing. So what are your thoughts initially on on Brian Thomas Jr.? Austin. Yeah, man. So, so this is a fun prospect. I, I like Brian Thomas Jr. a lot. I'm starting to get a lot higher on him, and he's projected to run like four four seven, which did surprise me a little bit. I was like, damn, is is he really that fast? Is Brian Thomas Jr. that fast? He might be, man. He's if there was one word to describe him, I think I would go with explosive. Right? This is he, he's a vertically just dominating wide wide out. Uh, he's gonna receive very promising draft capital. You love to see it, man. We're talking late first is is what I'm anticipating, what I'm expecting. Uh, you know, and he's just another quality wide receiver in this 2024 rookie class. Uh, and I've seen flashes. If we if we if you guys want a player comp, I've seen flashes of Martavis Bryant. Uh, there, I think they're very convert comparable in in many regards and i'll tell you what man if you watch lsu's games this year you know that Jaden daniels left a lot of meat on the bones this mm -hmm. year right so these stats that we're seeing 60 receptions almost 1100 yards 15 touchdowns and 18.0 yards per reception these stats from brian thomas jr they could have been better man they could have absolutely been better and these are great stats like i'm not by any means, like this is the production we want to see from our first round picks in Dynasty and in the NFL, you know, and in the actual NFL draft. So uh, I will say that he did catch a pass, a, a touchdown on 25% of his receptions, right? That's just, it doesn't happen. And and the fact that he did that at the highest level at LSU, it, it do that, that absolutely impressed me. Uh, and and any time that the ball is in Brian Thomas Jr.'s hands, he can absolutely take it to the house, right? There's there's no question. And watching him get in and out of his routes and his releases, he just he did it so rapidly, and and it was just a huge positive, is what I'm getting at. I would love to see Brian Thomas Jr. go to the Buffalo Bills. I would love to see him just compliment Stephon Diggs that he, he, that you know big six four frame. 
with immense speed. I think that would be so great. I think it's just one of the better landing spots. So we'll see, man. But but Brian Thomas Jr. needs to be on your radar. Fun prospect. Good player. Yeah, I, I initially dove into here with, with him kind of definitely looking down the barrel of, of kind of the 108. And I, I I think with both of these guys, I came to the conclusion of I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that they're locked in there. I, I'm not like overzealous about either one of them. But Brian Thomas Jr., like I said, like you said, vertical game is on point. That's kind of what he was for them in a lot of situations of what he did. You don't get that. You don't get to the number one TD receiver in the in the nation without being having a strong vertical game like that. Uh, like you mentioned, what do you say? Twenty five percent of his touches were t- were touchdowns. Stupid. Yeah. Right. Video um, game numbers. So vertical game is on point. He's a tall, rangy wide receiver. He's got these real long arms. They kind of his his ball tracking is really really solid. Uh, those arms will just kind of come out of nowhere and have the ability to just pluck stuff, especially kind of over the shoulder and tracking. He has plenty of speed to run past defenders where I think the other guys uh, a little bit different speed. But Brian Thomas, I think he's got really strong speed once he gets going. Those long legs get rolling. He gets going down the field. And I think, you know, high four fours could be what we might see from him. So plenty of speed to run past the defenders. That's kind of evident in the vertical game. Uh, but, you know, the route his depth in route running, which in other, in other words, I, I'm kind of saying like the nuance to his route tree, I don't think is, is really there. They weren't, they weren't asking him to do a whole lot, a lot of crossers across the middle and a lot of vertical, different kinds of verticals. And, and the vertical is something that he doesn't really need to learn very much on, but all the other things he kind of does. But as I've gone on and on with looking at prospects coming into the NFL, I I'm, I'm not overly concerned with route trees. Um, you know, DK Metcalf historically was a guy who didn't have, I'm not comparing him to DK Metcalf. I'm just saying like DK is a guy who comes in that didn't have a huge tree. Uh, th- th- and obviously we had Jalen Hyatt last year without a great route tree, but a vertical guy. Um, and I think that's not the worst kind of comp and how they, you know, how they were attacking. But I, I like Brian Thomas's game a whole lot more uh, than what I think he has more stuff to his game, more parts and pieces to his game than a Jalen Hyatt did where um, he was just so explosive and, and seemed to be a little bit more of a one trick pony and needed to be developed. I don't think there's as much development. Um, and I think it's going to be a little easier for Brian Thomas to get involved year one um, with a late round pick, maybe in the first like, you know, Kansas City is a popular one. The Bills are a popular one. Somebody who could use that, uh, replace Gabe Davis or replace MVS, I think would be would be good. A real strong red zone threat from him. Uh, just an absolute monster down in that in that green or red area. As some people call it, like I said, great ball tracker. Seems to have pretty reliable hands. There were some drops, but uh, I thought the ball tracking and the and the plucking was pretty good. The body control was really solid. I thought his yak ability was 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 pretty good. It's not outstanding by any means um he, he has there was plenty of times we're watching the all 22s and watching some games there were chunks of games where he disappeared whether that's on daniels kind of running around and neighbors being so good and some other pieces on uh, lsu you know I, I can't say for sure but there was definitely some times where he kind of disappeared throughout some games and i'm not really sure of the physicality he's not really as much of a bully i think you would you know, with the frame and size that he has, he doesn't necessarily play like that. Not that he can't, but like he's he's winning more on vertical stuff rather than being this big guy who's relying on going down there and out muscling you for contested catches. I guess don't confuse contested catch for ball tracking as is, is not you know those are two different things. I think he's a really good tracker of the ball, but contested catches maybe not quite the bully that you would uh, want to see. So. Brian Thomas, uh, any final thoughts on him? And then we'll kind of get into the next guy and compare and contrast them. Uh, I, I think you brought up some really good points. Like I, when I watched the tape, that's what I saw too. So it's it's good to hear you, you know, confirm that essentially. Um, but he's a good player, man. So uh, you want to move on to the next guy, another late first round in the 2024 rookie dynasty draft. Yeah, We have Troy Franklin, right? So here's a guy that I actually have one slot earlier. I am a little bit higher on Troy Franklin. I'm okay with putting them in the same exact tier. Troy Franklin right now, wide receiver out of Oregon, is my dynasty 108 in this class. Brian Thomas Jr. is the 109, just for context. So this is, now here's a much more flashier player, right? I would say, mm. I think he's more exciting. I think he's, yes. I think his tape was more fun to watch. I think he's, uh, again, flashy, I think is a good word to use to describe Troy Franklin. 
We got a six foot three hundred eighty seven pound thinner receiver, but but he's got the height, man. And and again, it's it's okay, right? You don't have to necessarily be just this beast of receiver. We're seeing receivers succeed in all different shapes and right. sizes. It's it is okay. You man. can throw you a lot John of that notion out the window at this point, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I wholeheartedly agree, dude. Almost fourteen hundred yards for for Troy Franklin this season. Fourteen touchdowns, right? That's I mean, these are some big boy numbers. Just a true vertical deep threat with with real NFL speed. We're talking Troy Franklin right now, man, and he candidly wins in intermediate routes, right? This this kid can play. Uh, he can definitely improve as a blocker. I will say that. I don't know if it's necessarily because of who he is or the fact that he's sub one ninety. I don't know. Like I, I'm not necessarily sure. I haven't fully been able to pinpoint it, but it's okay, man. Like he can absolutely improve as a blocker. He's going to continue to improve as a player. I mean, the kid's literally 20 years old. All of the, none of these players are polished, right? I mean, except Marvin Harrison Jr. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Well, uh, he, 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 even Marvin, the great Marv, has some flaws. Uh, but back to Troy Franklin, man. I'm anticipating four three speed. This kid can fly, right? He, again, flashy, super fast. He has long strides, six foot three. These long strides. He high points the ball super well, uh, and he's not afraid to lower his shoulder and get a little bit of physical, right? Like fight for some extra yards, which did surprise me again because he is one eighty seven. Like I, I thought he would be more of like that, you know, avoid, avoid, avoid. But like no man, like he can take some hits. Um, he's fluid. He gets from zero to sixty so fast. Like I, I loved what we saw from from his quick feet on on the tape he crushed press coverage he crushed it aggressive hands i thought he was creative i th- i thought that he was flawed but but a, a promising prospect that he improved astronomically over the calendar year if you look where he was the year before and where he is today oh my god dude he he is going to make so much more money he's going to be drafted so much earlier and he he's just you know hats off to him man he's He's uh he's a late first round pick in this 2024 2024 class but this kid can play. Yeah, you, you mentioned uh he'll be he's 20, he'll be 21 all next season essentially he's turning 21 very shortly so uh 21 years old in his in his first season PFF had him as wide receiver 15 in their in their ranking 87.3. Um, so you can wow. take the PFF grades for yeah. whatever you want them to be. I, I'm not necessarily taking them for anything, but what I do use them for is a, you know, a guideline of like sorting by that and then going, all right, these guys all had those grades. Those are, those, I'm going to go look at the analytics and then those are going to be some of the guys, first guys that the analytics check out that I'm going to go back and watch on tape. So I think it could be a good guideline. So take that for what it is. But like you said, mock draft database has them projected as a first somewhere in the late thirties, maybe early second, um, so that's, again, really solid draft capital on him. I think he's going to light up the combine. So uh, everything that you said there, he's 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 got easy speed is kind of how I define that. Speed was the first thing that jumps out to you. And it's it's not like Brian Thomas is where it's a he seems like, you know, gets going and it's built up a, a little bit more. But Franklin's speed was was really easy. He's a smart player. He knows how to work the field, attack defenders. He uses good varying speeds in his route uh, route tree. Uh, seem to be you know a little more defined than what you got with Brian Thomas Jr. Um, so again, yeah. you know Brian Thomas's isn't isn't as as refined as as what Troy Franklin's is. They do a couple like uh, Brian Thomas does some a couple of things a little better, but Troy Franklin maybe a little bit more versatile on what you can do with him right now. But all these players have different things that they need to work on and do. That's going to be the regime that drafts them job to fit them in and do what they do and then work on expanding uh, what they can do and how they can do it. Uh, and, and the ability to learn and teach is, is something that is, uh, you know, a, a really redeeming quality in a lot of these guys. And both these guys seem like they, they would be the, that type of guy. Uh, the yak is, is solid by the numbers. Uh, he's certainly tough to catch with that speed in the open frame with that thinner frame. He's not just tossing guys around. Uh, but like you said, he's not, he's certainly not getting, you know, bullied around out there just because he is a little slight of frame. But, you know, I, I guess what I'm trying to say here is not all yak is really created equally. You put on a guy like Corley's yak, 
uh, from Western Kentucky and then Franklin's yak. They're two totally different things. Uh, you know, Corley's, you know, throwing guys off him. He's playing bully ball where, you know, Franklin's yak is, is built off of uh, his, that his speed is so dangerous. He can, some of that yak is predicated on, Hey, I'm so fast. I caught the ball. And now I'm, I'm just running past you down the field. Other, other, some of the yak is that, Hey, I did catch the ball on like a, a little bit deeper mid crosser, but I'm, I'm so fast. You're misplaying some of the angles on me. Um, and he can kind of switch it up and, and get back, you know, twist you around a little bit. Um, whereas, you know, a guy like Corley, who's led the nation in yak does plays his game more like, uh, you know, Debo Samuel style, not calling him Debo, but like that, get off me kind of running back with a ball in his hands. Uh, both are putting up good, pretty solid yak, but, um, you know, the, the thinner frame can doesn't, doesn't lean to core what Corley does. Uh, so, I think things that you're going to hear over and over again uh, with guys like this, with everybody with thinner frames, I just see it in all, a lot of write-ups. I hear a lot of people talking about it. You mentioned that he was good off a of press. I, I was able to find a, a f- some times where he played in press. Um, I thought his release was pretty good, and he's, his, his, his feet are pretty quick, so he can kind of get off it. But what you hear over and over again is lacking a functional strength because he is a little thinner and struggles with big, more physical corners. I think that's just something that by default, a lot of people just say and talk about with these guys because it, it 99% of the time can be true. I didn't see it a ton with him. I, I would, of course, prefer him to have somebody who was a little off coverage. But yeah, I mean, anybody who's a good corner who can get down and jam on somebody, there's not a whole lot of guys who are going to be awesome at at defending that. And then again, that's something you need to learn as you move forward. I don't even think there's a ton of teams in college that do just a, a copious amount of it. So uh, it's something that you can learn. And and Troy Franklin, you know, played a decent amount in both slot and wide. So it's not like he's, you know, has to be outside. I, I think you'd be doing a disservice not to move him around, uh, which he did move around uh, somewhat at at Oregon. I'm trying to get, grab the number here for you. The slot percentage, uh, he had a career 20% slot percentage. Um, so, you know, moving around 25% in 2022 and 18.2% in in uh in 2023 here so out wide 80 percent of the time and 75 percent of the time so you can kind of move him around those numbers for brian thomas jr a little little smaller uh for brian thomas jr getting a guy in the slot um let's see here 13 and 12 percent of the time so um a little more slot play from franklin but i think both guys can win in and out of the slot i you know franklin moving to the next uh level i think can give you a, a little bit more of a you know, defined receiver right away. And I think I would put him, you know, at least as, as a step above Brian Thomas right now, I I came into it a week ago after I did both of these guys with just being a little more interested in Brian Thomas, but I think I was just falling victim to his frame and what he is and what he can be and what he can do. And then you get the flashiness, like you said, of Franklin and kind of, you know, woos you back over. But there's a lot of good metrics and analytics that point to, you know, leaning in better shape of Troy Franklin. So when you have those two things kind of together and the film is checking out, you know, I will give the analytics some some love there and say, all right, yeah, I, I, I'm seeing all that. I like what Franklin's doing. And, you know, some people are mocking him to the Ravens. Eh, you know, I don't know that I love that a ton, but... Uh, he's going to get the draft capital and he's, he's, he's a very, very, uh, interesting player that, um, you know, I don't know if I'm as gung ho as a lot of people. It seems like a lot, some, some people are throwing him up as the wide receiver three. I think that's a bit crazy. Um, but how about, how about, what are your thoughts here on, uh, anything else on, on Troy Franklin or, or comparing and contrasting Brian Thomas and Troy Franklin? Uh, so yeah, three receiver three for Troy Franklin is a little too early for me. I have him at four, but it feels like it's a tear break for me, right? right. Like I, I, I don't think. Spoiler alert: Romo Dunze is my receiver three, and mm-hmm. and I do feel confident in that, right? Like very, yeah. very confident. Um, and like who knows, man? Maybe in a year we look back and Troy Franklin turns out to be the better receiver. I don't think that's going to be the case, no. but but again, like like Troy Franklin so. is is he's a good player, and uh, my receiver five in this class, the ner- the very next guy is Brian Thomas Jr. So just to show you guys where I'm at, I got them at receiver four and five, and dude, you you got me a little excited. You started talking about Malachi Corley. I uh, <laughs> oh my god, dude, he he's someone I've fallen in fun. love with. 
He's yeah. someone I've fallen in love with, and I never, I just, holy cow, man, I am, I'm heavily invested, and in, I'm absolutely going to be targeting it in my draft classes. Uh, I, 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 there's a few things I want to say about him real quick. I, I think he's a player we need to talk about. I mean, he had over 3,000 collegiate receiving yards, right? Mm. That in itself is just huge production. You're, you're never going to be mad about a player producing at a high level for a long time in college. Like, I get you want to, like, maybe be an early declare in, in some regards. I understand it. But I, I don't mind if you go back and still dominate, man. And and on top of it, Malachi Corley also had sub five percent drop rate, like great hands, mm-hmm. and and he had an astounding forty forced missed tackles in twenty twenty two. So we're talking elusive, right? We're we're talking stocky. He's so stocky, mm-hmm. dude. Go go put on the tape. Go watch him, dude. He is so big. Um, he was a yak monster at Western Kentucky. And again, like you mentioned, you, you hit, you absolutely nailed it. You said Debo Samuel. I saw shades of Debo Samuel. I didn't think he was as high quality, but I, but I absolutely saw shades of it, right? He was the yeah. first guy that came to, first guy that came to mind. And, and the final thing I'll say about Malachi Corley at manufactured touches, I think they'll be absolutely very, they'll be vital for his success moving forward, right? He's yeah. the type of player that he's just, he's so unique. So I, uh, I I really wanted to touch on Malachi Corley. I'm I'm happy you brought him up though. Yeah. He's uh he's he's gonna be fun, man. Yeah, I, I I like Corley. We talked about him with JB a little bit. Um, I really like him. I've been I dove into Worthy, and Worthy's giving both of these guys a run for their money right now for me and Mitchell, AD Mitchell, both on Texas. Um, neither one of these guys strike me as as wide receiver. Uh, Franklin and and Thomas that is strike me as wide receiver ones on their own team. They they they. They strike me as more of a of a of a Robin rather than a Batman, um, mm-hmm. you know. And it's no knock on them. They certainly can put up the wide receiver one numbers with the kind of vertical games that both of them possess. They're kind of, you know, similar but but contrasting players a little bit, right? When you kind of get down to it, they both kind of win vertically is kind of their their calling card right now. There's the stats don't necessarily back it up in the metrics, but I like Brian Thomas with the ball in his hands a little more than I like Troy Franklin. But Troy Franklin's speed is is so much easier and and quicker. You know, I think I think the the yak shows up a little better on his profile. But um, I think both of those guys could be really good. You know, what what could replace them as the 108 that tear break that you're talking about that kind of spawned this whole conversation would be another wide receiver or two who I believe could come in and be a dominant force as a number one. Who that guy is right now, I'm not really sure. We were hoping maybe it would be Keon Coleman has some of those traits that could be that nasty guy, but risky, risky profile right now. Uh, The highlights are awesome, but he also kind of disappears at times throughout the tape, was good at Michigan State, was actually a little better than Jaden Reed in a season at Michigan State. Um, saw that tweet today but you saw that tweet today yeah yeah (laughs) I I saw a couple people tweet it uh today I forget who who the first one was but you know and then somebody said Jaden Reed was hurt regardless like you know Keon Coleman kind of has that alpha could be that one that number one kind of guy there but I'm I'm definitely scared to take him like at that 108 109 I, I would prefer it to take that chance if I'm the league champion at 112 or you know you know, acquired two, two or something like that and, and take the shot on them because there's a lot of things to like, but I don't know that I want to take these guys seem a little safer for overall. And I, like I said, I just, I just did worthy and Mitchell today. And man, I really like both of those guys a lot. I, I, I think, uh, depending on, you know, landing spots, always going to be super crucial who the quarterback is. I mean, just look at Garrett Wilson right now, Garrett Wilson should be exploding, but right now has been held down. You know, we've seen Chris Olave, you know, somewhat, I think, I think Chris Olave could be even higher regarded, but somewhat getting, being held down by, you know, quarterback play, not being always where you need it to be. Uh, so, and we, we see that with, you know, Terry McLaurin is a, is a prime example. We saw DJ Moore for a long time. We just, it just had, they're still good players, but not quite getting to where they need to be. Cause they're not in the right role, not in the right system, not with the right quarterback. Um, those are just some examples off the top of my head. Uh, but any, anybody else who, who you could see creeping up here, we talked a little bit about Corley. There's, um, you know, guys coming out of the senior bowl right now who are, are, are heating up Ladd McConkling, Jacob, uh, cowing was, Cowan, was a guy correct. that we talked about with, with JB. I don't think he'll, he'll quite make it up that high, but lad, I think certainly could. He seems to be getting a whole lot of buzz right now. He could be somebody who could easily come for that one eight spot. I think. Uh, what are your what are your thoughts? 
Yeah, man. There's, there's, uh, I mean, all those guys are on my radar, right? There's a few others like, like Jalen Polk, uh, Jalen McMillan mm-hmm. out of, uh, Washington, you know, um, I, I do like Malachi Corley a lot. Like right now I have him super low in my rankings. I know we touched on him. He's someone that I think I definitely need to bump up a lot, right? My rankings will be updated soon. There's a few other guys across your mind. Johnny Wilson, um, you touch on A.D. Mitchell. I think you touched on Xavier Leggett, dude. He's one of the yeah, most... It didn't hit him there, but... He, he's one of the most exciting prospects, like, yeah. in this class in terms of, like, what he could be. And I think I kind of get the same vibe from, like, Keon Coleman in the sense of, like, what he could be. But in reality, is he going to get there? It's, like, mm-hmm. not the highest chance, but you just... You never know, man. You never know. Um and I think Jonathan Brooks could come up here and get in, get into this spot potentially by the end of the cycle. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Absolutely. But I don't know how many other running backs will get up that I, high. I I have Brooks at the one twelve. Probably, I don't even know if I'm too high. I I am probably higher than most people on him. But I I think I'm gonna prove to end up being right, dude. I think Brooks is gonna prove to be who we thought he was. Um, and it, it, hey, we play Dynasty. This isn't a redraft. If if you want to fade him in redraft, I get it. Don't fade him in Dynasty, dude. Reach reach a little bit on Jonathan Brooks in your Dynasty rookie draft. And one last receiver I would like to talk about. I don't think we've said his name yet, man. Tez Walker, mm-hmm. right? Devon Tez Walker is his full name, but he goes by Tez Walker. He had some notable performances against ranked teams. He dropped 106 yards and a touchdown against number one ranked Georgia. 132 yards and three touchdowns against Miami. Those are some of his most notable games against ranked teams. Out of UNC, man, he's a dog. Drake Drake May loved him. He officially declared. We're talking about a six foot three, 200 pound. I'm thinking like four four five to four five zero speed, right? I I think he can move like that, right? Twenty two years old, he's a little bit older, but he's a legitimate deep threat. Devontae Walker, that is, and he's yeah. I would say he's projected to be. I think it's going to be mid second round, if I had to guess. He was a problem at UNC with Drake May, man. He was he was good. He he can high point the ball well. Uh, he that immediately stood out to me when I turned on the tape, right? And, and Tez Walker, he's he was the focal point at UNC in a lot of ways. And I think that, I don't want to say he could be a focal point. Maybe maybe he could be a focal point in the NFL for, for some teams if he's put in the right situation with the right quarterback. But I think he's going to be a steal in dynasty rookie drafts. I think he's overly faded right now, or maybe he's just not talked about enough. I just I think that he's a legit player, and, and he's a hell of an athlete, man. This kid, like, turn on the tape, dude. Tez Walker is fun. He's He's a good player. Yeah, no, Tez, Tez has, has, has a lot of uh, pros and cons. Seems to be getting a little beat up at the Senior Bowl by some some coverage there, but still like Tez a good bit. Guys, Other guys performing well at the Senior Bowl. Javon Baker uh, is getting a lot of love from yep. uh, UCF mm-hmm. right now, so he could be climbing some charts. Malik Washington was in the East-West Shrine game. People love him, and he's, he's, he's got some, some really, really impressive stats, uh, so he could climb the board. I don't know if any, either one of those guys will challenge for the spots that we're talking about right now, but just throwing a couple more names at you. Roman Wilson right, having right. a good senior bowl. Um, so a uh, lot of fun stuff. There's going to be a lot of jockeying for position through this off season. And that's kind of what we're doing right now. We're starting to massage these out a little bit. We're, we're, we're talking Troy Franklin. We're talking Brian Thomas. I think all those guys are going to be up there. Uh, Xavier worthy for me is, is giving them a run for their money and NAD Mitchell. So um, I think we, when we get down to it, that's probably going to end up being kind of another tier right there is we're going to have, um, maybe four or five guys and maybe Jonathan Brooks in there of, of the next tier of guys that we talk about. But right now I wanted to talk about those two guys uh, a little bit to get everybody sort of familiar with them because those seem to be the guys that are, you know, hot in the streets right now at that point. So any, anything else on your mind before we close up shop here? No, man, this, this, this was a fun episode. Might've been a little bit shorter, but like, I love these receivers, man. This is, this is such a deep class, the 2024 yeah. class in terms of receivers. Right. And I'm excited to just talk about the running backs. Like not, uh, I guess I, I want to throw out a few names of the running backs real quick. That's cool with you, man. Like there's, there's yeah. some guys I, I'm super excited to talk about in the future, like Bucky Irving or Aldrich Estime out of oh, Notre sure. Dame. Uh, Blake Corum's a warrior, man, and uh, Braylon Allen, Trey Benson, Jonathan Brooks, Will Shipley, you know, Marshawn Lloyd. He was at this, you know, mm-hmm. he, I, I was I saw a lot of content on Marshawn Lloyd lately. Love that. Caleb Williams literally handpicked him at USC like he wanted him on the roster. Uh, Jace McClellan, Kendall Milton. 
Dude, there's uh, Dylan Johnson. I love, Dylan I really Johnson. like Dylan Johnson yeah. out of Washington. I'm probably too high on him, hit, so don't listen to anything I say. We had episode a couple weeks ago with JB, so yeah, yeah. shout out there. Yeah, um, dude, there's, this This class is fun, though. It's, I keep Lobb using that right word now fun, but it's New exciting. Hampshire is, is somebody in the senior bowl who's lighting up a really, really strong receiver at running back. Um, so keep keep an eye out yeah. for him. He could be climbing the charts. But, you know, second round going to be a lot of fun in, yeah. and, and very valuable in – in dynasty uh, super flex rookie drafts, especially tight end premium. I mean, JT Sanders is going to be a steal uh, who, who's been my, mm -hmm. you know, tight end too. And if you're playing any premium, you know, you got to put him up above some of these receivers we've already talked about. Um, I got no problem taking him in the first round. Uh, we'll see where these quarterbacks end up. And some of those guys might end up jockeying for the one eight to, to one ten. You know, it's going to be Knicks and McCarthy and Penix. We'll see where the draft capital lands. That's going to be really important to, to kind of seeing how we, lay out the quarterbacks uh in this draft but second round if you're if you know if you're striking out on on first rounders uh you know scrap it and go go hit some hit the second round hard um and and get two three four picks and either by the time the second round rolls around you'll be able to move those those picks up if you want because i think some value will be you know the the general consensus will be how great the second round is and people will want the picks or you'll just have an awesome you know I, i've had a lot of success in the past you know lightly rebuilding and having three or four second round picks and just, you know, grabbing guys like, you know, Ramondre and, and, you know, Amon Ross St. Brown and, you know, just those, those type of players, all the, you know, Christian Kirks and, you know, all th those kind of yeah. guys all, all through second rounds. I'm drawing a blank on a bunch of the other ones, but I've had a lot of success uh, kind of doing Even that. Even like Michael Pittman, dude, like there's just some really good yeah. receivers that, that go in the Brandon second Iyan. round. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I knew I was missing somebody else in that class. It was like that T. Higgins, like like that type of um, yeah, you know, that group, right? Like right. there were some good receivers that year. Um, but dude, I I think we're gonna see as we're wrapping up here. I think we're gonna see five quarterbacks that are drafted in the first round. Like I think we're we're gonna see in the NFL draft, right? Like obviously we're gonna see Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, Drake May. You got three right there. Michael Penix will be a first round pick, of course, and then Ooh. I'm. I don't know if it's a hot take. I feel like it's going to be a lukewarm take. I, I firmly believe Bo Nix, come draft time, will be a first round pick in the NFL draft. I yeah. really think. I really think so, man. He's been too good for the past two years. I think the the I think the conversation begins at at QB six. Is JJ McCarthy is is he gonna be a first round pick? Right. I really think those five quarterbacks are gonna be drafted. And this twenty four class, I'm telling you, dude, is so good for content purpose. Like we are gonna see so many offensive players that get drafted early, and you know we love to see it. That's what we want. Yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting to see how the quarterback plays out. A lot, a lot of people are out on Penix as far as uh, you know the dynasty community guys. I, I think that's silly for me. I'm I'm all in on Penix. I think I just think there's too much need for quarterback. I think all those guys could potentially go in the first round. And I don't think any of them, if they don't go, are getting out of the second round. Uh, so, do you like Michael Penix? Uh, how do you feel about Michael? I Penix? love Michael Penix. I don't, I don't want to go in right now. Um, I think he's I think he's head and shoulders above those other two guys for me playing the quarterback position, but. You know, if the draft, if the NFL draft comes in and tells me that, you know, the well, Knicks goes and McCarthy goes in the first round and Penix goes in the middle of the second, then, you know, of course, I'm not going to draft Penix in the first round of my Superflex. I'm going to I'm going to probably move him back to the second round and I'm going to make sure that I draft as much Penix as possible. because I still believe in him, mm -hmm. but it's about adjusting as well. You can't get so stubborn that, hey, I love this guy. And so I'm just going to keep drafting him up here. Hey, you might you, you could reach a pick or two, but you got to slide him back. You know, I'll, I'll, I'm fine with, you know. Hey, I was wrong in the in the long term. I might be right, but like I still, I don't want to, I don't want to waste my super flex draft capital by having to have, reaching for Penix so high, where a lot of people are going to have him, you know, maybe two five or something like that. If he goes in the second or third round, where I'll I, I'll I'll still take him two four or two three. I'll take him a little ahead of where a consensus is saying. So, you know, that's kind of the game you also have to play. Um, you know, if Keon Coleman, if you love Keon Coleman and he he slides a little bit, you probably got to slide him down your rankings just a little bit. It's not to say that you dislike the guy anymore, but you just got to be aware of kind of what consensus is going to do a little bit. And you don't need a draft consensus at all, but you need to be aware. You can't be two tiers ahead of consensus, I guess, is kind of what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, yeah. anything else before we get out of here? No, I think we talked about, <laughs> I think we talked about close to like 40 rookies today. Yeah, yeah. Or at least just. But 
we put the microscope over two of them and and dug in a little bit and i i came to the conclusion that i am i am not firmly believe that either one of those guys will will be for sure locked into the one eight like i am locked into those seven other guys before them so um that's kind of my takeaway here but right now it'd be troy franklin leading leading the pack with with brian thomas uh slightly behind i'm with you man so uh yeah, it's been fun. I'm looking forward to talking about the 24 class moving forward. You know, the the content's only going to get better, man. Oh, We're only yeah. going to get closer, and uh, the, the hype is is real. It's only going to get bigger. So yeah. I'm excited. I'm ready for it. We're going to be zooming in on more of these guys as we go, finding different ways to talk about them instead of just giving you singular profiles. And then uh, we'll be we'll be hitting you with a, a live or a, a rookie mock here uh, in the next week or two. So appreciate you guys, and we'll catch you next time. Oh, be sure to go check out Austin at Austin Abbott FF on the Twitters. That's Austin Abbott with two B's, two T's, and two F's. Uh, my man is cranking out some quality stuff, mostly focused around these uh, prospects, but also some other good nuggets sprinkled in there right now about some uh, some some potentially undervalued uh, guys that are in the league. I appreciate it, man. I appreciate y'all. I, dude, I, I love talking to all of y'all. So um, let's get the FF out of here and uh, let's do it, man. All right, buddy. Peace. <laughs>